Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Dr. Madeleine Muller here, and we are broadcasting live from the Family Medicine Boardroom here at Cecilia Makewane uh, Family Medicine Department. Um, and we're very happy to be hosting um, this session as part of the Funda Fridays today. So today our presentation will, has been prepared by uh, Dr. Somele Zordani um, with the help of Dr. Fuentes. Um, and I'm very happy to hand over to him as he talks to us about IRIS. Uh, just a reminder to please put your names and your MP numbers in the chat for CPD purposes. Um, and can I ask that if there is any problems, for example, if you suddenly uh, can't hear us or can't see us, if somebody would please unmute and just tell us so that we can that we can fix it. Thank you very much. I'm handing over to Dr. Dani. You don't have to speak. You can just speak. Oh, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, as has been said, I'm Somele Zodani. I'm one of the interns in Ward 5, and I'll be presenting on IRIS. So we first have the table of content. I'll be going through the introduction, definition, synonyms, IRIS causes and conditions, IRIS in HIV negative patients, the clinical presentations, risk factors, pathogenesis, clinical diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, uh, clinical manifestations, management, prevention, prognosis, and conclusions. <clears throat> Introduction. Um, the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, Iris, was first discovered in the 1980s in patients with tuberculosis and leprosy who were receiving treatments. The doctors then noticed that the patients are going to be started on anti-tuberculosis um, um, treatment. And what happens, the patients started getting better. And while they were getting better, the, the condition suddenly just changed and became worse and they had uh, inflammatory symptoms. The overall um, incidence of iris is still unknown, but the majority of the studies report that um, 25 to 30% of HIV patients who are on antiretroviral therapy will have iris. Um, estimates of the pre prevalence of iris in asymptomatic HIV patients initiating ART vary from 3 to 38%. The potential complication of highly active uh, retroviral therapy was um, first reported in the 1990s. Most patients develop symptoms within one week to a few months after ART started. It can lead to a poor compliance and adherence um, to ART, worsen HIV progression to um, AIDS, and also decrease the quality of life of the affected population. Um, it has been associated with, um, high, with high morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV. Um, definition, what's this iris I keep talking about? The term iris is actually immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, which describes a collection of inflammatory disorders associated with paradoxical worsening of pre-existing infectious process following the initiation of antiretroviral therapy in HIV infected or immunosuppressed individuals. So iris has been described in a wide variety of um, illnesses in medicine, and it's got a lot of synonyms. synonyms. I've got some of them here. It could, you could call it immune recovery disease, immune reconstitution disease, immune um, reconstitution syndrome, immune restoration disease, immune rebound illness, steroid with, withdrawal disease, immune reconstitution disease, immune response reactions. Um, iris has also been described in HIV negative patients. A similar paradoxical inflammation has been seen in HIV negative patients after treatment for tub tuberculosis or leprosy, um, steroid withdrawal, discontinu discontinuation of tumor necrosis factor, alpha therapy, recover of neutropenia after cytotoxic chemotherapy, withdrawal of immunosuppression in transplant re recipients infected with cryptococcus uh, neophomans, engraftment of stem, stem cell transportation, transplantation, I mean. So um, iris can present um, in two, can have two presentations. 
It can be the paradoxical iris, which means the worsen of symptoms already of an already known disease or unmasking, which actually means um, the, the patient had an illness that was unknown, but when they started ARTs, they start having these symptoms. So this is a graphical representation of the two um, types of irises we have, the paradoxical one. Um, there is a new diagnosis and it's already known and they start treatment and there's a clinical deterioration. And then unmasking one, it's unknown. The patient's not known to have any other illness besides being ARV reactive. Then um, ART is initiated. Then there's a clinical uh, deterioration. Then the symptoms, we see the symptoms in the web. It's only when we can diagnose the opportunistic infection that the patient has. So um, in risk factors, um, we, quite, we have quite a couple. Um, the burden of opportunistic infections in the population, the degree of immunosuppression prior to initiation of ART, um, actually being um, CD4 count less than 100 cells, um, an accelerated rise in CD4 count following ART, rapid HIV RNA um, suppression within 90 days of um, initiation of heart, pre-existent latent um, opportunistic infection with a high antigenetic um, burden. Genetics play a role, particularly in herbs and mycobacterial infections. Um, and um, the, the genetics that play a role it's, will be the HLA, B44, BR44 associated with herbs, a virus in iris, and TNFA um, 308 um, star 1, ILA6 174 G associated with a uh, mycobacteria iris. It occurs approximately in 15% of patients with microbial or cryptococcus infection, infection to initiate um, ARVs. Pathogenesis, um, HIV infection produce both qualitative, quantitative and qualitative time dependent deterioration um, infections to the immune system. Immunodeficiency virus attacks the immune system, depleting CD4 T lymphocytes and predisposing patients to increased risk to opportunistic infections. After initiation of ARVs, there is there's an increase in CD4 count. A slower increase follows this and it counts for naive CD4 T cells. Later during the course of the treatment, there's a colonial proliferation of these CD4 uh, cells, causing a further increase in the cells. Along with CD4 T cells, there's also an improvement in CD4 positive T cells. This dramatic improvement in CD4 um, and CD8 positive T cells count, count leads to improvement in cell-mediated antibody um, immunity leading to the following, an excess pathogen-specific cellular immune response, decrease in the capacity of regulatory T cells to regulate and immunosuppress inflammation, uncoupling of both innate and acquired immunity, culminating in a, in a state of hyperinflation response against underlying uh, pathogens. So the likelihood of severity of iris correlates with two factors. The extent of CD4 um, T uh, immune suppression prior to the initiation of, uh, initiation of ARVs and the degree of viral suppression immune recovery after the initiation of ARVs. So this is basically um, a graphical representation of um, the pathogenesis. In A, we just have um, an, um, normal cells in a normal in a person that's not immunodepressed. Um, so the CD4 cells, these are the CD, CD4 T cells. Um, there are the macrophages, then there's a microbial infection, in microbacterial infection. The CD4 cells will um, activate the uh, macrophages and then there's phagocytosis and then um, it's um, the, the inflammation is contained. But then in, um, in, in patients, that will develop, will develop um, iris, 
there are no CD4 cells or there's very few, then um, there's um, microbial infection, but then the, um, the macrophages are primed, but then there's not, they're not activated by the CD4 cells. The cells that are primed, they accumulate in the body. And then when they, uh, the CD4, when the, when the immunosuppressed patient is treated with ARVs, the viral load will get suppressed and the, the, the CD4 counts start rising. And when, the, and the, when these CD4 count cells start rising in numbers, all these primed up uh, macrophages are activated at the same time, culminating in the hyper, uh, hyper inflammation, and then the, the body is not able to regulate this inflammation. So diagnostic criteria of iris, presence of AIDS in low, in, in, um, low CD4 count, in patients with low CD4 counts, typically less than 100. I'm a positive virological or immunological response to ARVs. The presence of clinical symptoms consisting with uh, inflammatory condition, temporal association between initiation of ARVs and uh, symptom onset. So um, the uh, differential diagnosis could be the um, drugs not getting to the bugs, adverse reaction to the drug, Additional diagnosis, incorrect diagnosis, inappropriate expectations of bug, uh, bugs being resistant to the drugs. All of this will be explained in the following few slides. So the first one you said um, uh, the, uh, drugs are not get to the bug. With this, it could be medication not being administered correctly. So for inpatients, we'd have to check the prescription charts to see if the, if the patients are getting the correct dose and are the patients getting the medication um, at appropriate times. I'm just going to mute somebody. Please just keep yourselves muted. Thank you. We can continue. Then for outpatients, we'll check if the medications were properly dispensed and if the patient knows how to take the medication correctly and check if the, if the medication that was given is actually correct dose for the patient's weight. Non-adherence, um, we have to explore with patients that are outpatients, we'll have to explore if the patient's actually taking the medication or not. Could be that the patient's also having um, mal malabsorption. Ask the patient if do they have any persistent diarrhea or vomiting or while on the medication. Um, drug interactions. Um, Anti-epileptic drugs, vampicin and polyvalent cat cations increase the metabolism of uh, dolutegravir, meaning that um, we're supposed to have it for 20, if it's supposed to be in, it's supposed to be in the system for 24 hours, but then if you administer with these medications, it's actually used up faster. Um, also, um, rifampicin reduces inefficacy, uh, it reduces inf efficacy in protein inhibitors. Difficult to reach site. Some of the medication may not reach the site of infection. For example, anti-TB medica medication do not always penetrate TB cavities in, lab in lung abscesses, making surgery um, unnecessary. Bug resistant to drug. Um, this is likely if there is confirmed sensitivity. Um, gene, ex uh, gene expect ultra with rifampicin sensitivity. More likely when treatment was either empiric or based on a test that does not identify resistance. Incorrect diagnosis, um, empiric therapy, for, for example, um, without microbial, microbiological confirmation has been, any, when, uh, when a patient's been initiated in medica on medication, Common pitfalls include um, prescribing rifafor to patients with positive urine lambs, but this can also be indicative uh, of disseminated TB and non-tuberculosis microbial infect infections. Similarly, non-infectious um, conditions such as malignancies, especially lymphomas and Kaposky sarcoma can min mimic um, infections, um, adverse drug reactions, Patients may be responding to appropriate treatment, but have developed an adverse reaction like neurolog neurological efferents, toxicity, 
or drug-induced liver injury. Additional diagnosis. Um, sometimes you have to consider that there might be a second or even third diagnosis to the diagnosis that we already have. Inappropriate expectations. Some opportunistic infections take longer to improve than others, and a patient might deteriorate despite appropriate therapy. <clears throat> So this is just uh, basically a summary of some of the conditions that can actually cause um, um, iris. We've got um, the bacteria, the viruses, the protozoans, helmets, um, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, and tumors. I will be I will be basically highlighting some such as the TB, MAC, CMV, toxoplasmosis and Kaposky sarcoma. Clinical manifestation. So basically with iris, the clinical features of the iris are strongly related to the type of um, location of the pre-existing opportunistic infection or non-infectious immunocompromising disease. Pre-existing infections may, may or may not be clinical apparent to prior to initiation of, of ART. TB-related iris. The incidence of um, paradoxical TB iris is estimated to be 18%. It is caused by mybacterium tuberculosis. It is reported with median durations of iris ranging from 10 to 180 days within the first 60 days of starting ARVs. Um, pulmonary and lymph, lymph nodes involvements are the most common reported, reported signs. New or expanding lymph nodes or abscesses, worsening um, radiolog radiological features, constitutional symptoms such as the sweating, the coughing, the weight loss, um, epidermis, cutaneous lesions, peritonitis, meningitis, pleural fusions, and, exp and expansion of pre existing tuber tuberculomas and, um, are among the common symptoms. Management. It's usually self-limiting and it generally, generally does not require alteration on, of, or interruption of the anti-TB or ARVs. Treatment of the TB inf infection according to the sensitivity and site using um, up-to-date guidelines. <clears throat> Administration of NSAIDs or short course of corticosteroids is warranted for iris causing significant symptoms. Symptomatic uh, management such as pleural taps and aspiration of fluctuant lymph nodes is warranted. Um, cryptococcal meningitis iris. Um, it usually occurs um, in approximately 20% of patients with um, cryptococcal meningitis. It's caused by cryptococcus neophamins. It usually happens within the first three months. Um, in clinical manifestations, we've got um, CNS manifestations and non-CNS manifestations. With the uh, CNS, with the usually, there's usually a raised uh, intracranial pressure um, where you're going to get the headache, the nausea, the vomiting, and decreased um, consciousness. With the non-CNS, um, 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 it's usually a disseminated infection, thus resulting in symptoms such as lymphadenopathy, pneumonitis, um, or ocular manifestations. The management. Um, treat um, so, um, CMV with B, which is going to be one uh, milligrams per kg, and um, for furocytosin, which is going to be 25 milligrams per kg, for a week, then you move over to um, fluconazole, um, 1.2 kg per os for a week. Then you move to the to fluconazole, um, 800 milligrams, 800 milligrams per os for eight weeks. Then you move over to fluconazole, 200 milligrams per os for a year, and up until the CD4 count is to more than 200. And if it does, the CD4 count doesn't um, get to 200 within a year, you continue up until it gets to 200. Um, supportive management of the patient. Um, Serial therapeutic LPs are warranted in raised intracranial pressure. 
Um, South African um, HIV clinicians are still a society advise, advises the non-use of steroids in cryptococcal meningitis. So um, this is basically a study that um, was done, um, which is actually an adjunctive dexamethasone in HIV-associated cryptococcus meningitis. Um, it actually showed that it, um, using dexamethasone in cryptococcal meningitis was not actually better than not actually using um, um, dexamethasone. So it was, the study was done in Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Laos, Uganda, and Malawi. Um, all the patients received um, either um, dexamethasone or placebo for six weeks, along with a combination of antifungal therapy, which was amphob and fluconazole. The mortality was 47% in dexamethasone group and 41% in the placebo group by 10 weeks. The, pay, the percentage of patients with a disability in 10 weeks was higher in the dexamethasone group, which was 25, than the placebo group, which was 13%. Clinical adverse events were more common in the dexamethasone group than the placebo group. Fungal clearance in cerebrospinal fluid was slower in the dexamethasone group. <laughs> um, with uh, Kaposky sarcoma um, related iris, the incidence is um, um, 7%. It is um, caused by Kaposky sarcoma associated herpvirus or human herpes virus 8. Uh, manifestations, enlargement of new lesions, new lesions, inflammations, edema and pain, progression of pulmonary pulmonary Kaposky sarcoma can lead to airway obstruction. So this is just uh, basically a typical um, Kaposky sarcoma, and this is actually the tongue. Management. Um, the management requires us to um, refer to, to oncology and in larger centers or in the in first world countries, they usually also do, um, to refer to dermatology. Uh, most symptoms are usually resolved spontaneously when, when um, ARVs are continued. Corticosteroids are not recommended and early systematic chemotherapy according to extent of the disease. Um, cytomegavirus associated iris. Um, also known as immune recovery uveitis or immune recovery vitritis has been reported to in 16 to 63% of HIV infected patients with CM, CMV retinitis following the initiation of um, ARVs. Manifestations could be um, painless floaters, blurred vision, uh, photopia, decreased visual acuity or ocular pain. Many develop, develop extensive vitritis, papillitis, cataracts, um, epitoneal um, membranes uh, formation, and crystal, uh, crystoid macular edema. The management is to continue ARVs. Um, you treat um, cytomegalovirus or valnagan cyclovir. With, uh, which is 900 uh, milligrams per hour for three weeks, followed by uh, Bangaska Cyclovir, um, 900 milligrams per hour once a day. It's it's wise to um, to refer the patients to ophthalmology, um, and they will start the patient on topical glucose topical glucosteroids drops for um, six weeks. Intraocular pressure you should usually be measured for about four to six weeks. If it's above the normal range, and then glaucoma drops can be added. Uh, microbacterium avium complex related iris usually occurs um, one to eight weeks after initiation of ART. It's caused by microbacterium avium complex. It often manifests as pain, as fever and pain, painful lymphadenitis. The majority of the patients with iris due to untreated treated MAC infections have negative blood and bone marrow cultures. 
in lymph node biopsies of patients with AIDS and untreated MAC infection, well-formed gran granulomas with a relatively few visible organisms will be appreciated. Management of uh, MAC infect uh, related iris um, is to continue ART as per guidelines and uh, microbial therapy, which is treated with azithromycin, athambutol, and um, rifampicin. In cases of inflammatory lymph nodes, lymph nodes can be aspirated, NSAIDs and steroids are warranted in uh, MAC um, iris. Pneumocystis pneumonia um, related iris. Approximately 5% of patients with HIV who have PCP will develop, develop iris. It's caused by pneumocystis gerovensi. Uh, manifestations um, you can have um, recurrent fever, increased cough and chest um, comfort, dyspnea and hypoxia. Chest x rays finding such as central perihilar infiltrates, patchy infiltrates consolidations, hilar lymph adenopathy, pneumothorax, and pleural fusions. The management is to treat PCP with cotrimoxazole, oxygen supplementation, continue ARVs, and corticosteroids are warranted. So this is a study of um, adjunctive, adjunctive corticosteroids may be associated with better outcome for non-HIV pneumocystics pneumonia with um, respiratory failure. Um, it was a systematic review of a meta-analysis of, of observational studies. So 2,518 2, cases from 16 retro, retrospective observations um, studies were included. Corticosteroids um, adjunctive treatment showed a significantly lower mortality in non-HIV PCP patients with respiratory failure compared to non-CAT. It was associated with better clinical outcomes. The use of steroids may be withheld in, withheld in non-HIV PCP patients without hypoxemia. So um, this is um, toxoplasmosis related iris. There are fewer cases described of um, toxoplasmosis related um, iris than um, um, TB iris and cryptococcal iris. I'm just saying, please keep yourselves on mute. You can continue. So it is caused by Toxoplasma gondii. The clinical features um, are, are features such as headaches, focal neurology, seizures, and confusion. Management is to continue ARVs, treat Toxoplasmosis with cotrimazole, two tabs, eight hourly for three weeks. And in cases where the patient actually has cerebral edema, then we can use corticosteroids. Um, in holistic management or general management of iris, uh, mild iris for mild symptoms, we we can we can uh, the treatments focused on treating the underlying condition and symptomatic management. Um, NSAIDs for fever or pain. We drain abscesses um, when there's abscesses or um, fluctuant lymph, lymph nodes. Inhaled corticosteroids for bronchospasm from mild permanent inflammation. Supportative management for hydration, correction of um, electrolyte abnormalities, and optimization of nutritional status. With severe irises, um, antibiotics um, against underlying infection. Steroids can be used to, uh, to suppress the inflammatory response, but then we have to look at the risk benefit analysis prior to starting them and take into consideration the patient's comorbid to other illnesses. Um, important except, exceptions include cryptococcal meningitis with iris, which worsen meningitis symptoms, cranial, which could be cranial nerve defect, hearing or vision changes, and worsening of Kaposi's sarcoma. In these cases, which uh, corticosteroids should not be uh, used, um, uh, they show that it has shown um, worsened outcomes. Uh, 
We continue ART and accept severe cases of iris. <coughs> Discontinuation of ARVs may be considered in life-threatening cases of iris not improved by corticosteroids, usually in patients with um, central nervous system, system associated iris. So this is basically the decision to use um, corticosteroids. Survival benefits, life-threatening, symptomatic improvement, reduced hospital stay, diagnostic uncertainty, potential adverse reactions in Kaposki, um, cryptococcal meningitis, infections or metabolic. So the recommendations of um, South African um, um, HIV Clinici Clinicians Association on steroid use. Um, in TB pericarditis, the risks outweigh the benefits uh, driven by increased risk of Kaposi sarcoma uh, to uh, so we avoid routine use. Cryptocortical meningitis, steroid increased mortality, so we avoid. In uh, PJP, hypoxic patients benefit from oral prednisone 40 milligrams twice a day, then you taper down to 20 milligrams. That's 40 milligrams twice a day for two weeks, then you taper down to 20 milligrams um, um, for two weeks. Treatment of paradoxical TB iris, um, it reduces morbidity in patients with non-neurological iris. So you give um, 1.5 milligrams daily for two weeks, followed by 0.5 milligrams per, per kg daily for two weeks. Prevention of um, paradoxical TB iris reduce, um, reduce iris events in patients with CIFO count less than 100 who started on ARVs within two weeks of TB treatment. We give, they gave prednisone 40 milligrams for two weeks, followed by 20 milligrams for two weeks. So this is a study on prednisone and uh, prednisone and um, microbacterium indicus prakani in tuberculosis pericarditis. So randomly 1,400 adults were assigned to definite or probable tuberculosis pericarditis to either prednisolone or placebo for six weeks and to either M indicate, indicate, indicus prani or placebo administered in five injections over the course of three months. Two thirds of the patients had concomitant human uh, HIV infection. Um, adjunctive therapy with uh, prednisone in, within the M indicus carni, parac prani, um, did not have a significant um, effect on the combined outcome of death of all the causes, cardiac tamponade requiring pericardiosynthesis or constrictive pericarditis. Both therapy, therapies were associated with a significant increase in the incidence of HIV-associated cancer. The use of adjunctive glucosteroids, glucose corticosteroids, um, introduce the incidence of pericardial constriction and hospitalization. The beneficial effects of prednisolone were with respect to pericardial constriction and hospitalization of familiar were similar with HIV positive and HIV negative patients. So prevention of iris, um, active, active screening, investigation and follow active screening, a screening of HIV and opportunistic inf infections, investigations and follow-up of HIV infected patients, Initi initiation of all patients as soon as they diagnose, uh, diagnosed with HIV, Pre prevention of initiation of ART in lower CD4 counts, um, proper history and examination um, on initiation to exclude opportunistic infections prior to starting, if opportunistic infections are present, start the appropriate therapy. So prognosis, the majority of cases of um, um, iris are mild and self-limiting. Severe iris and CNA, with CNS or uh, pulmonary involvement can potentially lead to death or permanent impairment. So the conclusion, iris is a sign of improvement of, is a sign of improving, improving immune health. 
Um, several different opportunistic infections have been linked to immune restoration. Continuation of ARVs is recommended except in the most severe cases of iris. Adjunctive therapies such as glucocorticosteroids may, may also be needed in certain settings. Stopping iris increases the risk of, of acquiring new opportunistic infections and developing iris again with restarting ARVs. Always rule out conditions that can mimic iris. These are my references and a special thanks to Dr. Yusime Ordaz Fuentes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Dr. Dani. Um, um, actually, and that was a very, probably one of the most comprehensive talks that I've heard of Iris in quite some time. Normally it's like a single slide in an art presentation. So we appreciate the amount of effort that you guys have spent on this. I actually want to quickly go back and just talk about this slide. So there's two big comments I would like to make about Iris. The one thing is, is that the ARBs we are using at the moment is really safe with very few side effects. So although TLD has potential side effects, they're actually in a very, very small percentage of patients and the side effects are usually very mild. So the principle is, is if you start somebody on, on art and in the first three to six months, they get sicker, you know, always need to think about iris. And iris can be anything depending on the underlying opportunistic infection. So iris needs to be one of those very um, yeah, suspicions in your mind. When somebody's on art, they're not supposed to be getting sicker. They're only supposed to be getting better. Don't blame the ARVs. Um, go and look for those underlying infections. Um, I wanted to talk about prevention of iris because in the last couple of years ago now, um, there was a study done regarding prevention of, it was a local study done in Cape Town. I don't know if the details right in front of me, but this is where they started all the patients they were starting um, on TB treatment and they were going to start on, on ARVs um, with a CD4 under 100. They gave this prevention regimen of prednisone. So that was the 40 milligrams for two weeks and the 20 milligrams for two weeks was a nice, easy, simple. And they definitely had a statistically reduction in, 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 um, in iris events. Um, but what was important with that study is that there wasn't nearly as many adverse events due to the steroids. We're normally very paranoid about using steroids. It was a small study and it was a single study and it's caused quite a lot of discussion. What's important to realize that at the moment, we don't have that as a routine part of our management at the moment of people with TB treatment. So it's not in our guidelines that when you start somebody on TB treatment with a CD4 under, under 100 that you would routinely use ARVs. And certainly for the nurses, um, I would not recommend that you, you introduce steroids at the moment in those scenarios. For the doctors, this is sometimes worth discussing. And you might sometimes have patients where, depending on the condition they're presenting with, uh, say, for example, they've got a very large gland that looks like it might end up breaking down and becoming ulcerative, where you're really quite worried about iris. And I will discuss those patients. I think we're still on the early days of this. Uh, we've got Dr. Stead locally um, to look at scenarios where it might actually be useful to use steroids for, for prevention. Um, but at the moment, it's not something that we are doing routinely, but it was, a, it was certainly a very interesting study that I think has changed practice um, in the Western Cape. And um, that's all from me. Dr. Yusimi, would you like to come and add some? Yes. Um, let's leave you with it. I'm going to come, come and sit here because I'm not sure my microphone is movable. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to comment that there are other opportunistic infections that are common in our setting, like the hepatitis B, that usually present between two to eight weeks after the initiation of ARBs, and the patient coming to us complaining of the nausea, vomiting, abdominal pains, fatigue, fever, can be accompanied also by the jaundice, tender hepatomegaly. We also see a lot of people with herpes zoster that are two to nine times more common in people who are HIV positive on ARBs than the one who are HIV positive not on ARBs yet. And they, you know the typical presentation, the painful blister, but also we can see a, a lot of ocular complications like keratitis and Monday. In relation with the use of esteroid, we know the corticosteroids are 
powerful drugs that we use a lot in many conditions to decrease the inflammatory process that is caused by the inhibition of the cytokine release. But at the same time, these corticosteroids are accompanied by important side effects. So we have one of them, the hyperglycemia, the intraocular pressure, decreased immunity. That is very important in our people living with the virus, especially if they are already with the CD4 count less than 100, because more opportunistic infection can come, more HIV-associated cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, lymphoma can be present, okay? We have also the arrhythmias because they increase the glomerular filtration excretion. Uh, of the potassium, uh, calcium, and phosphate. So we have a lot of important side effects. So it's very important that as a physician, uh, before we prescribe the drugs, we take in consideration the risks and the benefits of the prescribing the ordinary lying condition. I don't know if it's my personal view, but since we implement the UTT, I see less iris than before. And this one will be because, I mean, we initiated the person with a higher CD4 count than before. Thank you very much. Is there any questions from here in the family medicine department? Um, if you're out in the, on Zoom, please do put your questions in the chat and please remember to add your name and MP number for CPD purposes or attendance list purposes. Um, any questions from here or anybody who would like to bring some, some further comments? Yeah, at the moment, nothing in the chat. I think it was so thorough. Oh, there's a, okay. Thank you very much. Yes, there is a question about drug-induced liver injury versus iris. Excellent question. So one of the issues are, is when you start somebody on TB treatment and then you start them on their ARVs, especially those with the low CD4 counts, um, two things can happen when they're about four or five weeks into treatment. The one is a drug-induced liver injury, um, and the other is a potential TB iris. And the problem is, is they can look very similar. So the patient might come in nauseous, might be jaundiced, and you do an LFT, and quite often all of your LFT markers will actually be up. And it's very important in that scenario to be able to identify, is this a patient with TB iris, where your priority is to continue that TB treatment, um, or is this a patient with drug-induced liver injury where your priority must be to actually stop the TB treatment? So one of the things that is very helpful there is being able to look at what's happening in your liver functions. Um, and it's important to understand that DILI and, and TB affects the liver in different ways. So TB, when it affects the liver, tends to either press on the liver through lymphadenopathy, or if it creates granuloma on the liver, it actually has these granuloma or cavities in the liver itself. It doesn't poison the liver as a whole. So in general, TB iris will have an obstructive picture. So you will see an increase of your ALP and your gamma GT. A drug-induced liver injury usually affects the liver globally. So the majority of them will give you an increase specifically of your ALT, AST, not that helpful, and your bilirubin. So there are very good guidelines in terms of your cutoffs where you're going to have to manage a patient as a deli. And for that, you're going to look at your ALT. So if your ALT is more than three times the upper limit of normal and the patient is symptomatic, then you are going to need to stop that TB treatment. And if the patient has got an um, ALT of over 200, even if they're asymptomatic, you're going to have to stop that TB treatment. So please go and look at your guidelines, look in your, um, in your, for that. And then if your um, bilirubin is more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, then you also want to think in terms of a drug-induced liver injury. Now, what we have seen, which has been a concern in the past, is patients who have very high ALPs and gamma GTs. So they've got quite dramatic disseminated TB. The ALP might even be at seven, 800. The gamma GT is quite high. The bilirubin is not over 40, and the ALT might be like 80 or 90. So it's increased, but it's not over those critical thresholds of three times the upper limit of normal. And I've seen people who see this increase of, of liver functions, which is due to a TB iris, and they panic and they think it's a drug-induced liver injury. And we have seen patients who have lost because they ended up, their TB treatment gets stopped as a result because they are misdiagnosed. Um, with a with a uh, drug induced um, uh, with a 
with a TB, with a drug and use liver injury when it's actually a TB. increased and then you're going to need some advice and help on that. The other thing that's very helpful um, to distinguish TB iris from a drug-induced liver injury is that they will have other symptoms of TB iris. So their night sweats might be getting worse or they're suddenly developing fevers or they suddenly, suddenly the x-ray picture is also getting worse. So quite often there's a global picture um, of, of getting sicker which you won't usually see in the drug-induced liver injuries. So thank you, very, very good question and a very common pitfall. Um, great, so there's a question here about uh, symptomatic, uh, when, when you admit. The biggest reason for me, so with Dilly, the, the recommendations and the guidelines said that we're supposed to sub submit the symptomatic patients. Um, and I agree with you that sometimes if somebody's jaundiced and they're otherwise quite well, you can consider doing it as an outpatient. The biggest thing for me that actually determines determines admission, especially out in the districts, is whether the patient's going to come back for their weekly ALT monitoring. And what we have seen sometimes is that the patients vanish off the grid. So you send them home and they don't come back. So you need to make sure that they've got easy transport, they're able to go and have the blood test done, they're able to come back for the blood test result. Um, so there's, there's, it's, it's more quite often admissions, but more to do with making sure you don't you don't lose your patient. So you need a very well-educated patient and a well-resourced patient if you're doing it as an outpatient because they might be coming back for blood tests almost on a weekly basis. And that can go on for a good three to four weeks before you, you're going to, to challenge your, your, um, your TB treatment. Very good questions, well done. Yes. Right, so there's a question here about what you do with the TB medicines while you're waiting for the LFT results. If you get a patient who comes in is quite sick, so they're very jaundiced and they're vomiting, then yes, I would stop the TB treatment um, until you've got your LFT result back. The challenge with Dilly is that if you don't stop the offending drug, and remember, we don't always even know what the offending drug is, there's a 60% mortality. So they're basically being poisoned by that drug and keeping them on that drug. And you know, you're know you gonna have the results back within a couple of days. So what you don't wanna do is stop them and bring them back in a week or two weeks or a month. So you wanna bring them very quickly and not having their TB treatment for those two or three or four days is not going to be the end of the world, but keeping them on an offending drug, especially then if they don't come back for their results, which also happens, um, is, is going to be much more much more problematic. Uh, let me just check my chat here again. Great. Dr. Adonai, yes, will you please? Uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Adonai for a, or a few last comments. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think it was quite very comprehensive, and you specifically look at the French diagnostic criteria for IRA. And I think for the rest of the team, please have a look at the diagnostic criteria of iris. Um, the, 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 most of the data that was shown, uh, especially with regards to epidemiology, were pre-DTG, you know, and therefore perhaps there is a need for newer study. Now that we, you know, DTG actually causes rapid, uh, 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 you know, rapid decline in, CD, uh, in the viral load, and that's one of the risk factors. Acceleration reduction in the RFD, you know, in the viral load of uh, patients, is one of the actually uh, diagnostic criteria that you know for for iris. And perhaps uh, we need new data, especially in our setting, in terms of uh, you know our understanding of iris. And perhaps we really seen uh, fewer cases of iris. Again, we need new data. You know, we used to see a lot of those. Uh, in the past, but I think the numbers are actually much less, you know, but the implication for, for us as uh, frontline workers, nurses, doctors, is that we must not miss cases of virus because it has implication for ongoing adherence of treatment 
by the patient because the moment they are falling, the, the condition seems to be getting worse with the medication they are taking, the tendency is to stop the treatment. And therefore, that's an opportunity for us to reinforce our merits, you know, and we should be able to stratify the condition of patient to mild versus severe to life threatening. Life still to see, you know, life threatening conditions, especially if it involves CNS as well as respiratory, uh, you know, new onset hypoxemia in patients with respiratory condition will benefit from steroid. That's safe, sure. But those patients will need admission. However, those mild cases perhaps only need analgesia because, again, you look at the definition itself, it's largely a, a dysregulated hyper inflammatory state. And therefore, there must be evidence of inflammation in addition to the ongoing symptom of the patient. So you don't, the, 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 there seems to be a saturation of symptoms of the natural cause of that particular condition of the patient. And uh, some of the common conditions again have been taken care of in terms of prevention. If you look at TB, be one of the commonest targets of virus we see cytomegalovirus. Unfortunately, we don't uh, we don't screen for it pre ART, uh, and also uh, a cryptococcal uh, cryptococcus. We have a reflex testing for cryptococcus, and that helps us to at least limits as due to cryptococcal disease. And the guideline kept you know has made provision that we do not rush to put ARVs in those patients. At least you wait for at least uh, uh, six weeks plus or minus. You know, again the new guideline, even the previous one and the new one, have made provision for us to delay the initiation, uh, ART initiation in patient with you know, TB. That equally helps in terms of reducing the risk because one of the trigger for ARVs is the earlier you throw we put ARVs in those patients with ongoing active opportunistic infection, they are at the risk of uh, developing high risk. Um, we, we definitely need new data, especially now that we have, we, you know, we have been tested and treated for everybody. Now, how many of these patients, uh, what is the city for count of these patients uh, at, at diagnosis at the time we are putting patients on the ARVs? Uh, is test and treat actually leading to more and uh, more patients with preserved immune function at the time of initiation? I think we need new data as well. I'm sure there are a few anecdotal reports that seems to suggest otherwise uh, in the past years, but we need new data going forward to better inform and understand, uh, 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 you know, how prepared we should be for managing iris in our patients. And those would be my comment. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adene. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there's a little project out there. It's actually quite an easy project because we should have all of that data on tier. So we just need somebody who's willing to sift through the secondary data and, and, and especially for us locally, because it also gives us an idea of how our program is working um, in terms of being able to identify patients that are oh, the test and treat, are we, are, we, are we testing well enough and identifying patients early in disease and, and getting them on treatment, um, which is, of course, uh, also reducing our HIV incidence. Um, any last questions from the floor here? Um, there's nothing specific in the chat. Dr. Jaka, I don't know if you've got any last comments before we close. Hi, Madeline. I'm in a meeting here about to start now at nine. I have no comments. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Thank you very much, Doc. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to close this meeting. Um, you all have a very lovely weekend, and the recording will also be made available on the Wusu Family Medicine and Rural Health YouTube channel.